This fourth annual season preview episode is brought to you by our friends at WCScreens.com, the gold standard of the screen printing and embroidery industry. Hey, you got needs in this area? Give our pals at WCScreens.com a call. Today I'm joined by my co-host Matt Gehring as we are breaking down the 2022 Notre Dame football season. You're not going to want to miss this one. So buckle up those chin straps, Irish fans. This is Onward to Victory. Hello, Irish fans, and welcome to Onward to Victory, a Notre Dame football podcast. My name is Alex Painter. And I'm Matt Gehring. And we sure are glad you're here with us, whichever one of the 50 states or two dozen countries we've had listeners check in from. Hey, no dilly, no dally today here, folks. We have important work ahead of us. This is the fourth annual season preview episode. We're going to be breaking it all down position group by position group, looking at the 2022 slate of games given our preseason team awards ahead of the September 3rd start. Really quickly, thank you to our Consensus All-Americans, those who donate monetarily to the show and keep us steamrolling forward. These gentle folks include Michael Finan of Rutherford, New Jersey, Brad Glazier of Williamsburg, Indiana, Will Fuller of Warren, Ohio, and Jeremy Scarlett of Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. And of course, as always, a special thank you to the 2022 season sponsor. That is our good pals at wcscreens.com. If you'd like to visit the virtual tip jars yourself, if you will, please head over to paypal.me slash onward to victory for a one-time donation or patreon.com slash onward to victory podcast for monthly support. So the boys have been playing football since 1887. But from a sheer ability to win football games, let's say in bulk, we have now lived through the most prosperous era of Notre Dame football. They've reeled off five straight double-digit winning seasons and counting, actually. And now under former, well, that was under former head coach, I should say, Brian Kelly, but out with the old, in with the new, so to speak. And Marcus Freeman is now our guy, elevated to head coach from defensive coordinator just days after Kelly's abrupt departure. So let's talk breakdown here really quickly. We're going to talk about the offense as a whole, and then we're going to talk about each major position group, and then we'll do the same for the defense. For our sound off segment, we will each pick a couple topics, so long as they pertain tangentially to the Irish, and we will each have the opportunity to pontificate over said topic for about 30 seconds. We will then discuss the schedule, and we will give our team awards out. Sound fun? I think so too. So Matt, let's get going man let's start with the offense shall we absolutely absolutely so give me your overall impressions what what are you thinking Thirty five thousand feet in the air i think the season's gonna rest on the as cliche as it is it's gonna rest on the arm of tyler buckner on a side note i had to laugh today i was i was in a twitter conversation where somebody actually had the audacity to say that this quarterback battle is closer than people think I, I questioned that person's that logic if they saw any part of the spring game Oof. or watched any any film from last year. It, it's clear cut who the number one is going to be this year. We know what he can do on his feet. We know what we can do when he's forced out of the pocket. But with the defense that we're going to go into week one, that's gonna, really going to set the tone for what we're going to be able to do in the passing game. And I think that if we can come out and have a strong showing there, win, lose, or indifferent, that's really going to set is going to set the tone with the secondary that Ohio State has. If we can have any type of passing game, really and truly, I think this team can have a special year. But if it's Brandon Wimbush esque in terms of you know not being able to be accurate throwing the football and getting it yeah. through the air, I, I think we're going to be in for a really really long season. So for for me, that's that's piece number one. No, absolutely. And yeah, we were at the spring game. You and I both were. And we saw that unfold firsthand. Let me just say it this way, Matt. If that quarterback competition is close, we are kind of in trouble unless Drew Pine has just made just outstanding strides. I mean, capable backup. Obviously, he's shown that he can come into a game, complete some good throws and move the move the chains a little bit. But 
yeah, if he's if he's our starting quarterback or if he's really pushing Tyler Buckner to the brink on that competition, we are in trouble. I agree. I, I think that's that's kind of an X factor for the offense myself. I'm looking most forward to the bully boys up front, man. I counted 67 starts among the projected five starters. Is this year after year? How do we have these offensive lines? We continually don't have this issue where we're like, ah, we've got the one guy coming back. Now, granted, I counted 31 of those 67 starts belong to Jarrett Patterson, but another 18 for Josh Lug, eight for Joe Alt and uh, Zeke Correll. I mean, these, these guys are going to absolutely bully some teams up front. I hate to keep going back to week one with this Ohio State game, but it's really going to set the tone. We haven't played, I think I saw a stat where we haven't played a top 10 team in week one since 1980 or 1986. Oof. So this is this is gonna be this is gonna be a test. I one of my points was that I think that the OL is is poised to be the best offensive line in the entire country. I'm not sure that that we've seen an offensive line this dominant, which there's really going to be no excuse for Buckner to not be able to throw the ball because he's going to have, you know, if everything goes well, he's going to have all the time in the world. Our running game should be very dominant. There's really no excuses other than inaccuracy at the quarterback position for us to not be able to move the ball on any team in college football this year. That being said, there's a lot of starts, but with a lot of starts comes a lot of miles on those big bodies. So it's also key that these guys stay healthy. I'm not so confident in next man up as I have been in the past. Right. We're very top heavy in terms of experience and talent in, in that position. But again, with, with Coach Heinstead back, I, I don't think there's going to be as big of a drop off necessarily, but there is going to be a drop off in, in caliber, which I think if you've paid attention to camp so far, they've shuffled on a ton of guys around on the line just in case guys get injured need to take you know a week off or so and and I think that that's going to be our saving grace is you know we're not you know we have Joe Ald at the left tackle but he's also not a true left tackle or if he gets hurt or has to slide somewhere you know Blake Fisher can slide over to the left tackle or you know god forbid Patterson has to slide over we've got those five that can play anywhere it's just what happens if multiple guys go down at any point in the season I don't want to steal our thunder here and I'm from our offensive line segment here in a moment. Matt, I tell you what, let's get bold. We'll give out, we're going to give out grades for each position group. I know that wasn't part of our plan, sure. but let's, I think your, your sixth man, so to speak, is got to be Andrew Kristoffich. I mean, only because he came in and really performed well last season and you just kind of probably insert him in and then just sh the shuffle ensues. I, that's my sense, but you're right. I mean, any offensive line, no matter how big of bullies they are, and they are big, by the way. Yeah. I read on Irish Illustrated, they're all actually putting on good weight, which is scary yep. to think. Yeah, you are just a couple injuries away from, from getting exposed, and that could upend your season. So, all right, hey, let's let's talk about quarterbacks. Let's talk about the quarterback room for a little bit here. So, yep. Buckner is our clear cut, at, at least we're, we're led to believe, mm -hmm. despite what Twitter may say, or at least some Twitter uh, users may say, Tyler Buckner is our number one. Drew Pine is our number two. What are your impressions about the other quarterbacks in the room, Matt? Do you have any strong feelings? I'm a firm believer that I do. And this is going to be a hot take. And if anybody's listening, they may blow us up in the comments. <laughs> I am a firm believer that Drew Pine is not our number two quarterback. Okay. I think Steven Jelly, with what he did in the spring game, the command of the offense, the way he was able to move the ball with virtually the same players that, that Pine had, he looks phenomenal. I mean, he looks great. I I would feel more comfortable with him under center than I would with Drew Pine right now. I think Pine can can run the ball better. There's no doubt about what we can what he can do with his legs, but a pure spinning the ball aspect, Steve does. I mean, Steve throws as good of a ball as anybody. So I, I would prefer to see him as our backup. I have more confidence in him. I think that. The more he gets reps, the, the more comfortable he's going to be. And that was actually going to be in my sound off take where <laughs> I think that, that that is my hottest of hot takes that I think I've had so far. I could see it. And, and I just read an article about Pine and Tom, uh, offensive coordinator Tommy Reese's relationship, but we saw it on the field. And 
it just, it was not pretty. I, I don't know what it was, but it was not pretty in the spring game. I also wouldn't be surprised if he's overtaken, but I mean, Tyler Buckner's the guy. Hopefully he just remains the guy and you don't have to worry about dipping any lower in the depth chart because there's not a lot of big time college football teams that can really withstand that anyway. But this is, it's, it's a young quarterback room. What grade would you give? It's who we're going to see if it's, if it's Buckner. And I mean, I saw some of his high school because we haven't seen him throw the ball. Right. We haven't seen him move the ball down the field in the air, but if you look at his film from high school, the guy can sling it. So if 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 Coach Reese opens up the playbook and lets him do his thing, if they have that much confidence in him, I, I mean, I think our quarterback room top to bottom is B plus A minus, which with the rest of the guys and the and the rest of the supporting cast we have around him that's good enough right now to allow us to contend in the big games i gave him a b like a strong firm b only because kind of a lack of of depth behind buckner all right let's move to offensive line we've already talked about offensive line man in my opinion obviously the strong point of the perhaps the program this year you could make an argument for some parts on the other side of the ball too again moving left to right Again, this is according to ourlads.com. You got Joe Alt at left tackle, Jarrett Patterson at left guard, Zeke Correll at center, Josh Lug at right guard, and Blake Fisher at right tackle. And that's, of course, all very fluid. I mean, we've seen these guys move around. I mean, we've seen Jarrett Patterson, I think, play three positions minimum over the course of his career. I do think this is going to be kind of a fluid group. They're going to mix and match. As you mentioned, a huge addition over the off season wasn't even the addition of a player, but it was former Irish coach who then took a brief sabbatical in Chicago to be with the bears uh, coach, Harry Heinstead. He's back in the program and he coached some daggone good offensive lines. The ones you remember with, you know, Quentin Nelson and Quentin Nelson. You had Michael McGlinchey, McGlinchey. You had the uh, you had Zach Martin, Ronnie Stanley and Ronnie, St- Ronnie Stanley. I mean, they're it just all pro all everything offensive line 67 starts though just with those front five and then we talked about a little bit Andrew Kristofich who is a who is a backup but I think kind of your utility guy you plug him in and you know he can he can get some snaps anything to add about the offensive line Matt if we're going to give it a grade the only reason I'm not giving them them an a plus is strictly on the depth if you were to take the backups, I would still give the backups a B minus or a B, which is better than two thirds of the schools in, in America with their offensive line. True. So by no means is it a bad backup system. It's just as talented as the core is, there is a substantial drop off. Now, the drop off is good to be starters probably at other schools, which is a good problem to have. But for for us. I, I still, it's a, it's a strong A for me. It's, it's going to be the catalyst for, for this, for the team. Oh, I agree. I have a strong A as well. I'll withhold the A plus as far as the looking at the room and all of its parts. All right. Now, Hey, quickly moving now to running backs. We've actually talked about the running backs a little bit earlier this spring in the state of the program episode that we did this post spring game. I think there's a ton of upside and a ton of potential Now, I know you're high on Chris Tyree, and honestly, I'm high on Chris Tyree, too. If Tyree doesn't perform, then I think this group could be in a lot of trouble. Audric Estime looked great in the spring game. Now, Diggs went down with his injury. Yes. So that doesn't help anything. I know they said he's going to be back sometime. I don't think he's going to be back for the start of the season. It's going to be sometime during the first part of the season. So Estime is going to get – and he he looked elusive. He looked great. Jadarian Price looked phenomenal. In the, I mean, the dude was getting five, six, seven yards of carry a lot of those times. From a depth, I'm, I'm okay. Maybe a little bit more so than I need to be with the depth. But the big problem that we have is we don't have one that stands out from the rest. You don't have a three back down that can come in and be your workhorse. It's going to be running back by committee. Mm-hmm. It, it really reminds me of the running back room for the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. You can plug any of those guys in. They're going to get you your yards, but there's not one guy that I would rely on more than the other. I'm high on Tyree from what he can do in the run game and the passing game. Yes. But in the fourth quarter, when we got to chew up clock in a three-point game, we've got to take five, six, seven minutes off the clock. 
I'm not sure that there's one guy that I think can always get us get to the second level to get that, you know, third and six first down, get us eight yards on a second and 10, something like that. I don't think that we have him in the backfield right now, which I do worry about that from your, you know, from your standpoint. Maybe Matt, maybe you're actually touching on my trepidation. You know, I, we've been spoiled a guy like Kyron Williams and even like Josh Adams or Tony Jones juniors. Those are just guys recently who you could feed the ball to and they'll just pound it. They'll, they'll get you tough yards. They'll get, they'll break off and get you long yardage. And you're right. I don't know if we have that guy, but Tyree is a much more dynamic and much better athlete than I think the guys I just listed anyway. So what, what grade would you give the running backs? I mean, that's a really good question. Their ceiling is no higher than a B, mm-hmm. but I think their floor, depending on we're going to get up front, we're going to get pushes, we're going to get the line to move. It's a matter of these guys, you know, f- getting into the second level, making guys miss, getting on the outside and turn on the jets. And I just, I say the the, the floor is a C plus, mm-hmm. but, but their ceiling's a B, which again, it puts more pressure on Buckner to make sure he's able to do the things we need him to do. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned you mentioned the floor and the ceiling. It's funny because I I had a B minus on mine. I think they're going to be somewhere in the middle. But at the end of the day, they have the running game is going to have a huge asset in a quarterback who can run around a little bit. A B. You mentioned the line. Your offensive line is your asset there. They're gonna they're gonna knock guys off the ball. You just you just know that's going to happen. All right. And our fourth and final group here for our offensive preview is the pass catchers. Pass catchers we use intentionally because we got a heck of a good one at tight end and it felt more appropriate to lump him in with this group as opposed to the offensive line. It might start and end with one name and that's the tight end, Michael Mayer. The presumptive future All-American tight end, Michael Mayer. So Michael Mayer, there's been a lot of ink devoted to him and he is kind of one of the X factors of the offense. Of course, he has had a wildly productive career at Notre Dame. Let's shelve Michael Mayer here for a moment, and let's talk about the wide receiver room. Matt, other than Avery Davis, whom I think we both have a strong affinity for, who do you like in the wide receiver room? One name and one name only, and that is Tobias Merriweather, the future first-round pick, All-American. You're in. Your chips are at the the table. I am all in on this kid. He's a freak athlete. Yes. I think they said he's put on like 15 pounds since January. This kid is going to be an absolute stud. I think for the longest time, what we've lacked on the outside has been speed, but more so height. Mm -hmm. We've had the tight ends that you can throw the ball up to, which has been great. But really and truly since, you know, Michael Floyd – Jeff Samarja, that five, six year era, we haven't had a pass catcher on the outside that we could just throw it up to. Tyler Eifert was the guy for the longest time. He was a tight end. Yeah. You know, so I think, you know, they have him listed as wide receiver three on the yeah. depth chart for the X position, but I, I do not think that is going to last at all. This kid's going to flourish. I agree. He's going to find his way to the top of the depth chart and at least get meaningful reps because. You're right. He's he's too dynamic. He's too much of a weapon and he's too big. Like when I thought about the last maybe five or six years, you know, Chase Claypool was a little bit bigger, but this guy brings me more physical gifts than even those guys. And that's something that man, Notre Dame has lacked in that position. Got the small scrappy or like the average size scrappy guys. I was thinking about the wide receiver room a few years ago. Uh, I mean, we've had Chris Fink, Roy Hunter. There's been talent, but man, there has not been just like the absolute freak that I think Tobias Merriweather it could be. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. But your chips are definitely out. All in, 100% <laughs> shoved to the middle of the table, all in. So let me ask you then, when we're talking about this particular room, what's your thoughts on Braden Lindsay? He's a guy that we've been waiting for to break out the last couple seasons, honestly. And obviously the raw speed is there. Do you think he breaks out this year? Depends on how they use him. He's too small to play outside. Right. He hasn't been reliable in the flats and in the slot position. I don't know where he fits. It's a complete wild card. You know, Lorenzo Siles has kind of taken over that position, which kind of shocks me. But at the same time, it doesn't. I I think if you can get him into a position, look, 
Mayer, I know that we don't want to talk about him because he's he's the end all be all for what this offense is going to run through. But with that comes a lot of double teams, mm-hmm. uh, which is going to be great for our slot guys who arguably are going to be matched up against you know the the outside linebackers. Which if they're going to be doubling Michael Mayer, it should in theory open up a lot of opportunities for our slot guys if they're used the right way. I don't want to say that anybody's been disappointing since they've come in because everybody has their own challenges and everything. I'm not going to pretend to understand what goes on as a division one football player at Notre Dame. But I think if we look to see if somebody who didn't necessarily, who had a high ceiling and hasn't touched it yet, it's been Braden Lindsay. Absolutely. And as I'm going through, he had quiet 32 catches. I was honestly surprised to see he had that many, but Michael Mayer had 71 last year. Do you think he's going to get, if 71 and a half is your over under Matt, what are you saying? I'm going to say just because I don't think that we have, I mean, other than Avery Davis, great story, but we don't have that other bona fide. Like, look, it's a bias. Mayweather is going to be great in time, mm-hmm. but I don't think he's anybody that garners the attention right now. Right. Mayor's going to have too many double teams. He's going to be a security blanket. I would honestly say under. I still think he's the best tight end in the country, but yeah. just because of who he's surrounded by, I would say under. I think he's going to be around the 65 to 68 catch mark this year. I tend to agree with you. He's such a focal point of the passing game. And if any one or two of these guys steps up, well, that changes the game big time. And six years in, we kind of know what Avery Davis is. And I love it. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Probably no one in the program more selfless than Avery Davis over the last six years, let's call it. But no, I I tend to agree. Going to draw a lot of attention from opposing defenses. And we've heard the cliche. We're not going to let insert person here beat us i think that's michael mayer for the irish uh any opposing defense is like what well, if brayden Lindsay's gonna beat us fine you know we're just not gonna let it be big number 87 so all right so what are you giving the pass catchers grade wise i think if including michael mayer i think you have to give it a b plus that's exactly i think if you if you just specifically go with the wide receiving core I'm probably closer more towards low b into the b minus range yes just because i think that they have a very high ceiling, but I also think the floor is extremely low with these guys from a talent standpoint. It's just going to be a matter about which receiver shows up on a given day. Right. And honestly, that's exactly what I have written here. I have a B plus, but Michael Mayer pulls the curve up immensely for this group. And not to say that they won't blossom or they won't grow and, and mature over the course of the 2022 season. But as far as proven commodities, the cupboard's kind of bare outside of, you know, Avery and Michael Mayer. So, all right, let's switch over to the defensive side of the ball. Shall we? You ready? A hundred percent. Best, best side of the ball we've got. I mean, there are fewer question marks on this side of the defense or excuse me, on this side of the football. What an exciting group. Let's talk first about defensive line out of all the three major position groups we're dis- we'll discuss. I am probably most smitten with this group. Really, you have a kind of, again, in the same similar vein that Mayer is talked about on the offensive side of the ball, the defensive side of the ball, it seems like most of the conversation is getting funneled directly through that Viper end. And that would, of course, be Isaiah Foskey. Matt, when you got that notification that Isaiah Foskey was coming back for another year, did you scream like a little girl? Because I did. <laughs> I did. I was very excited, but... I think the one thing that you always worry about with the coaching chains, regardless if it's an internal hire, an internal promotion, or an external hire, you never know what the player turn or turnover rate's going to be. Right. And when Isaiah Foskey said he was coming back, that's everything I needed to know about Marcus Freeman. Yeah. So that to me not only gave me reassurance for what the defense was going to look like this year, but for somebody basically to say, I'm going to forego being a top 10 draft pick. Because let's be honest, the the season that he's had, yeah. he was going to be a bona fide top 10, top 15 draft pick this year. For him to forego that to come back speaks volumes about what he feels like Coach Freeman, Al Golden, and the defense as a whole is going to be able to do this year. Just to recap here really quickly, Isaiah Foskey, 52 tackles last year, 12 and a half tackles for loss for a net loss of 128 yards. <laughs> That's ridiculous. 11 sacks, seven quarterback hurries, two, uh, six forced fumbles. I mean, that's just 
that's a video game production out of Isaiah Foskey. So having that guy back on the defense is huge. Of course, the uh, the rest of the line, there's they don't sleep on them either because, of course, Jason Adam Alola, who really blossomed last year, he really broke out in a major way. I was a guy I actually pegged. I, I got lucky. I said one of those Adam Alola brothers is going to break out. And so I end up I end up saying it was going to be Jason and I got lucky. But Jason Adam Alola is joining him at defensive tackle. If we're talking raw statistics, that's another eight tackles for loss and three and a half sacks to go along with 49 tackles. So he's another one to be really excited about. But a lot of people are very excited about the other bookend defensive end. That is, of course, Riley Mills. I think Mills is going to be great. I think from from top to bottom, what Foskey allows is he allows for everybody else to basically go free. Mm -hmm. You can't double team him because, you know, you're going to you're going to allow whether it's Kaiser to come through the A gap or the multitude of other guys that are just going to have single coverage, single one on one matchups. It's scary, and we saw it in the spring game. You and I talked about it after the game. It looked like an absolute brick wall from the run game standpoint, but I'm not sure. You know, we always talk about the front seven and being able to contain quarterbacks, making sure that they don't get outside of the pocket, keeping them in there to add some pressure. Our front four does that on the bookends, which is even even better to not allow them to get to, to do the rollouts and get mismatches with our linebackers. It's scary. I'm not sure I remember a time. I mean, even in the Manti Teo era, we haven't had a front seven like this in recent memory. I would tend to agree with you. And uh, we have a nose who's a true nose to just round out this position group. And that's he's a true nose in the sense that, man, you're not going to hear his name very much, but he's getting push up the gut. He's drawing double teams. And that's uh, Jacob Lacey, who is a senior, a guy who who's played who played early and often. And he has gotten a ton of meaningful snaps, even if you haven't necessarily heard your name and heard his name. And I know we have a lot of listeners who follow this day in and day out. And then we have a lot of listeners who rely on this particular episode to learn some of these guys' names. Jacob Lacey is maybe not a name you've heard on a ton of Saturdays. He's had some really nice games in the past, but he is huge. He is a huge guy to be lining up right over that center because he gets a strong push. I think if you're talking about the strength of the program, the only position group that I think can give the offensive line or run for its money is the defensive line. And I, you're returning so much productivity and not to mention, like we haven't even talked about the depth yet. You have so much depth. Like if you just go to the two deep chart, I mean, you of course have the other Adam Alola brother, Justin Howard cross played a lot of football. He's got some serious pedigree, the transfer, uh, Chris Smith from Harvard. Chris Smith, yeah. Yes. Yep. You have rotational players that you're not, mm-hmm. you're not going to hardly miss a beat. And what a luxury that is. Mm -hmm. So that being said, when it comes to grades, I gave him a flat A. I give him an A plus because I think that Jacob Lacey is going to be the most improved player, if not on this Notre Dame defense in the entire country. I think he's, I think the the reason for that is, is because everybody, like I mentioned before, you can't double team one guy Mm -hmm. and it's going to allow him to do things this year that he may have not been able to do in the past i think that aside from you know ohio state's got a really really strong run game so he's going to be i don't want to say exposed in a bad way but there's going to be a lot of attention that he's going to garner from the offensive line of ohio state i don't see outside of that strong quarterback play for the rest of the season that we're going to see other than caleb williams at the end of the season so we're going to go against a lot of run heavy teams Yes. So I think his stat line is going to be padded severely from that. But I think with that, it garners the respect that you're not getting to the second level on this guy at all. He's going to be a brick wall. He's going to be a force to be reckoned with. We always talk about nose tackles in the run game. This is a guy that has the speed enough to get off the block and to get after the quarterback in a way that not many nose tackles have the ability to do. He's definitely primed for this breakout. I firmly believe that. I think it's, I think he's got too many pieces around him that allow him to really shine with his skill set. I mean, and imagine if, if that to be true, just how much stronger that makes the entire unit. So let's move on to the Will, Mike, and Rover linebackers. Let's move to the linebacking core. Another position that, well, you're bringing back JD Bertrand, who was, who led the team in tackles, the only guy with triple digit tackles. 
he kind of came out of nowhere last year mm-hmm. too to log all 101 of those tackles. But uh, he was a huge lift for the defense last year. I don't know what they would have done without him, honestly. But standing on either side of Bertrand, you have Maris Leofau, who is a guy who I pegged myself to be a breakout candidate for last year. And of course, he suffered a, an injury during camp. And so he never got to see the field. And people are still pretty high on him. So Leofau will play the will. And then Jack Kaiser, he'll be playing the Rover. So how you feel about this group? You're going to line up Maris Leofau over Riley Mills and Jack Kaiser over Isaiah Foskey. Yeah. Good luck opposing offensive linemen. I mean, you don't say anything's impossible, but have fun trying to stop that. Yeah. Like I said, front seven, one of the best in the country, hands down, strictly because of what you're going to be able to do on the outside. Absolutely. We we bring up the three names, the honorary fourth guy, of course, Bo Bauer. <laughs> oh, one of my favorite players on this team, hands down. Every team, you can have your superstars, but you need those program guys. And he is a program guy. And he's always easy to pick out on the field, too, because he's got that long hair, of course. But um, so Bo Bauer comes back. And a guy that they're not really talking much about, but we've seen him, he can play. Again, when we're just talking about depth and we're talking about guys rotating in and trying not to really miss much of a beat, that's Jordan Botello. I mean, he's another guy we've seen make impact plays. And frankly, like I, people used to talk about him and Foskey kind of in the same breath. But of course, Foskey's been the one that's really taken his game to the umpteenth level. But Jordan can play too. Yeah, and then you got right behind him, you got Jalen Sneed, the freshman who it's going to be great that he's got Kaiser and Vitello to kind of be there be, you know, have them be his mentor, which is going to be great from, from a development standpoint, but you've got him. I mean, there may not be a better third string Rover in the entire country. I Jalen Sneed. When you're talking about freshmen coming in and making an impact immediately on this Notre Dame team that skews really deep, you got to believe Jalen Sneed is going to be one who comes in early and plays and contributes early in a meaningful, impactful way. So front seven, as stout as it can be, as stout as it has been in the better part of a decade, let's say. We talk about this front seven in the same breath. We talk about the the 2012 front seven, which was talented, of course. So what grade are you giving the linebacking room? Yeah, I'm going to give it an A, a strong A. Um, the, only, the only reason I don't give it an A plus is more so with what's going to be asked of them to do. I worry about conditioning. You know, Leah Fowles coming off the injury. Yes. Kaiser's got a lot of snaps. Bertrand's coming off a leading tackler for last year. So, you know, he was all over the field. Mm-hmm. I worry about I, I worry about their ability to be conditioned enough to um and healthy enough the entire season. If they stay healthy, I'd give them an A plus. I just I worry about with experience comes miles, and these guys have a ton of miles on under their belt. One guy who doesn't yet. He's from Davy Crockett High School down in Tennessee. That's Prince Cauley. And I'm, I'm yeah. curious to see what he's – I think he'll probably see a lot of time this year. He's slated to be Leah Fowles back up. So maybe we'll see a little bit of Prince out there. Now, bumping back to the secondary. Normally, when you lose a first-round pick in any position group, you're going to feel that hit. That hit, of course, was offset greatly. Of course, we're talking about Kyle Hamilton – uh, safety who was drafted unfortunately by the Baltimore Ravens this past draft uh, of course that hit was offset by a critical transfer perhaps one of the best transfers in the country and that's Brandon Joseph coming in to play the free safety position let's talk about the secondary though aside from Brandon Joseph who transferred into Notre Dame from Northwestern I mean we can make some assumptions he's a pretty smart guy <laughs> Let's just say probably smarter than both of us in the Zoom room here anyways. A hundred (laughs) percent. I think we can wear that. But aside from that, another position group that is deep and has some talent, particularly on the front end with Cam Hart playing cornerback, Ramon Henderson, Clarence Lewis filling out the secondary. But again, when we're talking about depth, uh, Houston Griffith, who played a ton of meaningful snaps last year. Uh, Let's see here with uh, 38 total tackles as well as DJ Brown. Oh, and Tariq Bracey coming in at the nickelback. This is another incredibly deep position group that really just accentuates. It's like the cherry on top for this defense. Yeah, what what I like most is the young depth that they have. You got Jaden Mikey, who, I mean, arguably is probably going to be the most utilized freshman on the defense. 
um, which is going to be great. I think he's he's got the potential to be that number one lockdown corner throw, you know, throw any wide receiver on an island and, and nothing's getting to him. My only hesitation with this group is every single year, Notre Dame's problem has always been the corners. Yes. It's, it's always been being able to contain – the big plays being able to, you know, rein in big wide receivers. And that's a worry of mine. I mean, as, as great as Cam Hart is and as great as Brandon Joseph is, Notre Dame has to prove me wrong. I've been burned too many times thinking, you know, in the Julian Love years. And yeah, I mean, even for the, I mean, even a lot of the times we gave up a ton of big plays, even with Kyle Hamilton, not to take away from Kyle Hamilton, but we played some of our best pass coverage when Kyle Hamilton was out. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we have the ability to do it. It's just a matter of putting together a complete season. I may not necessarily be as high on the secondary as you are, but I don't think I'm far off. And there's something to that, too. And spoiler alert, as I'm kind of we're kicking around our team awards here, and I feel like we've shown our hand on a couple of them. But I look at a guy like Tariq Bracey, who feels like he's had three careers in one uh, <laughs> where it's like he was like a shutdown guy. And then all of a sudden he was just getting exposed. And then he's like kind of done this roller coaster. I mean, I actually had him as someone who I consider who could be one of the most improved guys. If we're talking about season over season, over season, over season, he could be, um, you know, in in that nickelback position, but like, he's really indicative to a lot of the guys. I feel like where where you're high on him, but like Clarence Lewis had had spells where he played terribly, I thought. And no, you're right. So let's sound off. Shall we? Let's gonna, do it. <laughs> we're going to get three segments each, 30 seconds. I don't have a timer here, so we'll just go the honor Sorry. system. <laughs> yep. We'll do the honor system. So Matt and I have three topics that we would like to discuss. 30 seconds each. We'll just kind of go back and forth. We'll alternate. Said anything that tangentially or directly relates to the Notre Dame fighting Irish. So Matt, do you want to start off or do you want me to? Nope. I can absolutely start off. The uh, first thing I want to start off with. Yes, go for is- it. Is nominating Marcus Freeman as the best players coach in the entire country. Nobody can tell me any different. I saw a video yesterday where every practice he begins with talking to every single player, giving them a hug, giving them a handshake. I don't know if I've seen a coach that truly cares as much about each individual player. Doesn't matter if you're number one on the depth chart and you're an all American. Doesn't matter if you're walk on university player of the year. Marcus Freeman genuinely loves his players and it is a breath of fresh air given what we've had the last nine, 10 years. So for me, best player coach in the country, Marcus Freeman, nobody can tell me any, any different. That's pretty good. I'm actually going to turn the clocks back a little bit. I'm going to talk 30 seconds about a family member of mine who recently passed, who was the captain of the 1966 Notre Dame football team. And that is Jim Lynch, who was my mother's first cousin. So My first cousin once removed, Jim Lynch, captain of the 1966 team, passed away on July 21st of this this year, 2022. But Frank Pomerico, who was captain of the 1973 team, said that he was a kingpin of the Irish defense. And if he was the kingpin of the Irish defense, that means he was the kingpin of the best Irish defense ever assembled. In a seven-game stretch in 1966, that defense yielded exactly two touchdowns. That's the same defense that led the nation in every conceivable category. Era's boys went on to the national championship in 1966. So if you're otherwise unfamiliar with Jim Lynch, 1992 class of uh, the College Football Hall of Fame, he's in the Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Fame, and perhaps most importantly, he's in the Lima Central Catholic Hall of Fame as well. If you're not familiar, crack open those Notre Dame textbooks Jim Lynch, rest in peace, my friend and family member. You're up, Matt. (laughs) Fantastic. I don't normally want to bring up somebody from the University of the State up north, but I want to applaud Lloyd Carr. And the reason I want to applaud Lloyd Carr is for raising his son or his son in a correct way enough that's allowing his grandson to come to the University of Notre Dame. For those of you who may not be you know, paying close enough attention to the recruiting. CJ Carr is a five-star all-world quarterback in the class of 2024 that is verbally committed. And virtually, if you follow him on social media, is absolutely unequivocally in love with the University of Notre Dame. Lloyd Carr, of course, prolific coach, 
for the University of Michigan and had many battles with the University of Notre Dame. So being able to see CJ commit to us rather than the University of Michigan and see those two hats there and for him to go to the blue and gold hat rather than the maize and blue, it made my heart very happy. So Lloyd Carr, hats off to you for raising your family right. I'm taking my hat off. That's a good one. I appreciate that. My second one is Avery Davis. Avery Davis, one of my favorite players, I think, all time ever in Notre Dame's history. Came in, of course, as a highly acclaimed quarterback. Switches to wide receiver. Switches to running back. Switches to defensive back. And then he switches back to wide receiver. You've never seen a more program first guy in my opinion, in the modern era of Notre Dame football than Avery Davis. This wasn't a walk-on who's just trying to stick on and try to find his – find his. I mean, this was a highly claimed, nationally ranked quarterback. And to see a guy who has been so flexible, so team first, so program first throughout all the changes, throughout everything, is so refreshing. And with a good season this year, Avery Davis, from a reception standpoint, will become one of the most productive wide receivers in Notre Dame history and program history. And I'm super proud of him. He's actually interfaced with the show before. I've I've been able to correspond with his mom. He comes from a great family. I am super, super excited to see our pal Avery Davis once again for a sixth year on the field this year. My my last one is I've got a new title for the athletic director of Notre Dame, Jack Schwarbrick, and that is the king of spin. So for those of you that have been paying attention to this conference realignment um, and TV deals, um, there's been a massive TV deal that's bringing in CBS and NBC into the Big Ten for a TV deal. And at my initial reaction, I assumed that that was going to all but seal the fate of Notre Dame officially going into the Big Ten. But come to the rescue, Jack Schwarbrick, to spin in a news conference today that how great it is that NBC is now going to be with the Big Ten because it opens up the opportunity for Notre Dame to remain independent because now NBC is going to be able to advertise Notre Dame to a wider fan base than ever before because it's not like Notre Dame is not a national brand or anything. Um, But he spun it absolutely beautifully during his little presser today to a bunch of donors. So applaud to you to be able to spin things that should not be spun. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to get rotten fruit thrown at me because it's a real buzzkill, but Hey, Notre Dame needs to crack open their very own media guide. And they need to correct the 1902 and 1903 seasons on who was the head coach. James Farragher is widely regarded in the annals of program history as the head coach. When in reality, if you consult the newspapers, if you consult the school newspaper, if you consult anything, everybody knows that was Lewis Red Salmon who coached the team in 1902 and 1903, who also happens to be the very first Notre Dame All-American on the Walter Campus third team. Everybody, of course, knows George Gipp was the first first teamer. But hey. We got to fix this thing. Getting a little embarrassing. That's all I got here. That's our sound offs. Matt, what do you think? Kudos to you, Alex, because I'm sure that there's like two other people that even knew that that was a thing. So I applaud you for having that knowledge in the back of your head. Hey, and they're, those two people are jumping up and down right now, I will say. What we're going to do here, Matt, is we are going to fold the thoughts on the schedule with our final season predictions. Let's give out some awards, shall we? Absolutely. Let's do it. I got the red carpet rolled out. I got the velvet ropes put up. We're both wearing tuxes, right? Give us some awards. So let's start on the offensive side of the ball. There might be a consensus here. Who is your offensive MVP? I'm going to be surprised if it's oh. anybody other than Michael Mayer. Yeah. Okay. That's, mine, that's good. Yeah. Mine as well. Okay. So we have yeah. consensus. Our offensive MVP is Michael Mayer. How about this one? Breakout player. Who is your breakout player on offense? If you listen to the podcast before, you might think that my breakout player is Chris Tyree, but I'm going to spin it a little bit. Let's my do breakout it. player is going to be Lorenzo Styles. Oh. I think that he is overlooked from a wide receiver standpoint. I think that Mayer is going to be double teamed in a way that allows Styles to use his speed to mismatch against a lot of the linebackers and, and really have a strong year for us. 
Well, that was also my breakout there. I thought you were going to go Tyree. So I'm like, I'm going to go Lorenzo Styles and just really change the flip. The great script minds think alike, man. I, well, that's what they do say about great minds. So I have Lorenzo Styles as, as my breakout player too, for all the reasons that you so astutely said. I think there's, there's going to be enough weapons out there that it's going to really allow him to get freed up a little bit. And he's just still, he hasn't emerged to that point where he's going to be like the focal point of a defensive game plan. Because we already know who that is. All right, Matt, go ahead. Most improved. Let's see. Maybe we can go a perfect three for three because I think we're going to go. I think our fourth one's. Yes, but I'm going to. This may shock some people. I'm putting my most improved for Tyler Buckner strictly because I think that there's so many unknowns. There's too many people that doubt his arm. Nobody doubts what he can do with his legs, but there's too many people that doubt his his passing ability. If Coach Reese is able to develop him, pure talent that he has, he's got pure ball skill talent with, with the way he spins the ball. If he can bring that in, I think he's going to be one, top five, top eight quarterback in the entire country when the season's all said and done. If he's the most improved player, we're, we're looking at a pretty strong unit. I went offensive line. I Out of all the guys, like I didn't want to say Blake Fisher because he played like, I think he started two games before he was injured. And I actually chose, I actually chose center, Zeke Correll. Being someone who watches the offensive line, you could tell when Kristofic and Joe Alt came in, they they provided that immediate boost last year. Last year was so daggone confusing with that offensive line. And Josh Lug graded well. Jarrett Patterson graded well. I think Zeke Carell is going to be the guy in the middle who hopefully can just glue it together. He was my one true question mark among that front five that we had talked about. So I have him as my most improved. And maybe that's just like aspirational because if, if yeah, I feel like if Zeke Carell fits and if he does well, yeah, it's going to make our bully boys bigger bullies than they already are, which who thought was possible. Freshman MVP. Tobias Merriweather. Tobias Merriweather. Okay, so yep. that was pretty good, Matt. We went, we went three for four. Yeah, no, no question about that. The kid's going to the kid's going to be a stud. Who is your defensive MVP? I really, I I sat on this for like a half hour today thinking about it. (laughs) The easy, the easy answer is Isaiah Foskey. That's the easy answer. But I think the the true backbone of this defense this year, because he's going to have to be, is going to be Brandon Joseph. I think with what I alluded to earlier about, I'm not necessarily all that confident in a lot of our secondary I, I think he's going to have to fly all over the field. Yeah. And I think he's going to be able to break up some big plays. I think there's going to be some plays he's not going to be able to because he can't be in three places at once. Um, but I think if our defense has success, it's going to it's going to be on the coattails of Brandon Joseph. All right. So Brandon Joseph is your defensive MVP. I probably chose the easy way out then. I chose Isaiah Foskey. I, like you, I tried my best to think of thoughtfully and intelligently explain why I choose Isaiah Foskey, which you just did with Brandon Joseph. And I was like, I guess I'll just stick with Foskey then. <laughs> I don't know how, but I just have it in my gut that he's even going to top last year. And I just think he's that much of a freak out there. And, uh, you know, and he's got talented mates around him, which I think it's just going to create such a headache. But you know, he's shown that he can make plays. He, he can make plays when he's being doubled up and he can make plays out in space and he can rush the pat. He, he can do it all. Isaiah if Foskey. He do, if he, if he doesn't do what he did last year, that's not necessarily a bad thing either yes. because it means he's double teamed, maybe triple teamed, and it's going to open up the door for everybody else in the front seven, which you, you don't want to do. You know who he reminds me of? Not like this isn't a very good comp, but the, as far as productivity, which you just alluded to, you know who would just like who everyone knew is an animal and is a Hall of Fame defensive player in the NFL, Julius Peppers. Yes. Uh, Julius Peppers would have those inexplicable seasons where he was everywhere. He was everywhere, but he'd have five and a half sacks. And people would be con- so confused, but then you'd look and be like, well, Mike Rucker on the other side of Carolina's defensive line had 15 sacks. He reminds me of a, a Julius Peppers type who's everywhere. His, his athleticism cannot be denied. His impact cannot be denied. And then sometimes it won't show up on the stat sheet. He's the best defensive end that we've had since Stefan to Yeah. Breakout player, Matt, who's your defensive breakout player? This is very wishful thinking because if he's not a breakout player, pardon my French, we're screwed. And that's Cam Hart. (laughs) Like if Cam Hart does not have a breakout year, doesn't put people on an island, isn't flying around on, you know, when they start running zone, 
we're going to have issues. So I'm trying to put this into motion. Cam Hart, if you're listening to this, do what you're capable of doing and let's have the best year you've ever had. Let's do it. Mine, this is kind of this is kind of chintzy. My breakout player and most improved, I transposed over and over again. I flip-flopped them. My breakout player is Maris Leofow. I, I knew <laughs> uh, it. I, I, I knew it. Die, I have to die on that hill because I've already like planted my flag on it a couple times at this point. So now, damn it, I'm going to die on it if needs be. And pardon my French, I will die on it. I think Maris Leofow, there's just too many good vibes. There's too many good feelings about this guy. And the little we have seen him... Two years ago, you saw two years ago, he looked kind of lost at points, but you saw the skill, the talent, the nose for the football. And of course, he was putting together a real nice camp last year until he got injured. And, you know, he put together a real nice spring and people are just really high on him. Pedigree's there, man. He went to the same high school as Manti. So let, let's hope Maris Leofow pulls it all together, stays healthy and has a great productive year. Okay, Matt, most improved player. Who you got? Yeah, I said this earlier in the show. I, I think that Jacob Lacey is going to be the most improved player, if not in Notre Dame, in the entire country. I yeah. think with the pieces he has around him, he's uh, he's going to garner so much attention. Nobody's going to run up the middle on us for sure. And I think he's going to have he's going to be a quarterback's worst nightmare because we're going to be able to contain a lot of our quarterbacks that we play against in the pocket. And then you get Jacob Lacey running at you with with his bull rush speed. I, I had him as a potential for a breakout player because I think he's he's going to have a huge season. Um, but I think if we go improved off of what he's done in the past versus this year, he's had a steady career. But I think he's got the potential um, to be on some All-American list this year. Man, that's great. I'm so happy you're high on Jacob Lacey. Big 5-4 in the middle of the uh, defense. He's always been like, he's kind of been waiting in the wings in some respects. You know, he's obviously been, he was behind Don, uh, not Donovan Heinish, um, Kurt Heinish. You know, he's rotational. He would start. My most improved player, I, I mentioned Tariq Bracey earlier. I guess only because year over year, he could be considered the most improved player. Because like I said, it feels like he's had a couple careers in one where, where he was like the shining star of the defensive secondary. And then all of a sudden he slid into this weird like purgatory where he was getting benched and giving up big plays. And now people are like, oh, but he's really flourishing in this nickel role. So that would be kind of puzzling, I think, to a lot of people. This one might also be puzzling because I'm going with Riley Mills. Not to say he was bad last year, but I wanted to put him at breakout, but I had to stick with Maris Leofow. So... Three and a half sacks last year for Riley Mills. As far as stat sheets concerned, you're going to see a leap. And for the reasons we've talked about is uh, with Isaiah Foskey. So I'm probably gaming the system a little bit here, but it's our system. We can game it, I suppose. Absolutely. <laughs> Freshman MVP. Really Jaden two- Mikey. Yep. I, th- I think, I think he's poised to have a huge, huge freshman campaign. I think he's going to be used more arguably than any other freshman we have on the defense. Sneed could towards the end of the season, if injuries happen or if he just, you know, he's a freak athlete. So he might be in the mix, but I think in terms of just who's going to have the most reps, Jaden Mikey, I think is going to be right there. No qualms about it. I, I agree. Jaden Mikey's on my list as well as freshman MVP on that defense. Sneed will see some time too. But as far as who's who's primed to, to come in and based on the composition of the, the position group they're coming into, it's got to be Jaden Mikey. I agree. So let's talk really quickly then before we wrap up about final predictions. As we mentioned at the top of the episode, the Irish have entered this era of prosperity, tallied five straight double-digit winning seasons. I guess I'll just ask the question point blank, Matt, counting the bowl game, do you think that's a trend that continues for a six straight double digit win season in 2022. You're you're nodding your head. Pray tell. I have I have us at 11 wins. I've got us 10 and 2 in the regular season. As much as I want to beat Ohio State, I think we're about a year or so away from being able to match up with them specifically on the outside with skill players. I think it's yes. going to be a close game, but I still think it's I, I think it's going to be 10 to 13 point game. I think I honestly, I I was talking to some friends about this earlier. I think this Ohio state offense is the best offense they've had probably since the Ted Ginn years. I think that they're, they're arguably going to have three all American wide receivers, more than likely an all American quarterback. Yes. Probably an all American running back. 
it just, I mean, they're, they're studs all around. I don't know. We match up a front seven. I think that we'll get to the quarterback, but I think there's going to be too many big plays. I also feel like towards the end of the season, I think that Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley are going to find kind of find their rhythm as the season goes on. And I see the U. I think this is going to be the closest game that we've had with USC. And the only reason I don't I, I don't see us winning that game is the fact that it's out in LA. in LA. I think if it was home, I think it'd be an entirely different thing. Be earlier in the season, but I see bookend losses, and then I see us winning the Cotton Bowl over either Houston or Cincinnati. Oh, oh! I gotta tell you, we if we draw Cincinnati, I would just relish an opportunity to pummel them. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. I think it's more going to be Houston. I don't think Cincinnati's got the firepower with with losing Desmond Ritter and, and everybody else. Oh yeah, um, Sauce and, Gardner and joining, and everybody. And joining the new conference, man. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I I'm ready to see Cincinnati lose a couple games because boy did I get tired of hearing about them. I have them at you know I have them at nine and three in the regular season, and I'm not quite sure where that third loss comes in. And I hate to be a downer. I also have them, the bookend losses in Columbus and in LA. For the same reasons you mentioned, Ohio State is going to be tough, man. That is, and going into enemy territory right out of the shoot, I think they're going to keep it close ish. But man, what a tough, tough assignment right out of the gate for a brand new coach. We talked about this in the state of the program episode. How many times ever has your first real game. I mean, Oklahoma state was a game. Sure. But like, this is the start of the Marcus Freeman era where your first game is on the road against your alma mater. We'll see how they, if they rise or kind of shrink to that. And if they rise to it, they still might not win the football game, but we'll know if they rise to it for sure. Yep. I'm not here's, quite... a, here's a stat for you. Go for it. For, Go for it. For four horsemen podcast. I have to, I have to throw them some, some assist for this. Cause it was a beautiful stat. In top 10 week one matchups since I believe 1950, Notre Dame, seven and oh, Ohio State, oh, and two. Ooh, (laughs) that is so now again, we're talking probably the seven and oh is a while ago for Notre Dame, sure, but it's and and the oh, and two. I mean, I think they lost to Oregon, and Oregon might have been, I don't know if they were ranked in the top 10 when they played, but yeah, it's. I'd like it to be close, but for all the reasons that you said, it's 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 a tough battle. It's going to be tough, and I just I, that USC game just troubles me. I think for the same reason, it's it. I never like going out there. I don't think anybody does, but I I don't know why I have that one penciled in as loss. And and like I said, Matt, I'm not even sure where this third loss comes from, and hopefully it's a mythical one. I'm just looking at the schedule. I mean, Cle- I, a lot of people probably are circling Clemson as possible, but I I like our odds against Clemson at home. I mean, maybe it's the one. Like, hopefully they don't stumble down in in North Carol at North Carolina. But I don't, I don't see it. But BYU is another one that folks are kind of iffy on. So, but I have them winning a bowl game. And unlike you, Matt, I don't have, I don't know where which way we're going with the bowl or who we're playing. But which puts us at ten and three. So I am being um, a bit vague. So I do think we're going to continue this this double digit streak. Although I don't know who we're going to beat in the, the for the tenth win, nor do I know who we're going to lose to for the third time or for the third game, but I am at 10 and three. As long as that third loss is not to BYU, my Catholic blood cannot handle losing to the Mormons. Of no, BYU. no, 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 no. We <laughs> absolutely no. not. It's funny. You mentioned this. I, I keep very close tabs on who listens to the show or where they're from. Podcast has been going on for three plus years for, for over two and a half years. We had four, we had listeners check in from 49 different states with the lone exception of Utah. So I'm like, that that tracks actually. Like, why would anyone sure. from Utah want to listen to this show? <laughs> However, we did get a single Utah listen here probably about six months ago. So now our map is full, but it does speak to the fact that the Mormon is the mortal enemy of the Catholic. That speaks and to the that. University of Miami. Oh, that's true too. So, so you have 11 and three, I have 10 and, or excuse me, 11 and two, I have 10 and three. So we are very optimistic about this one. Yeah. I don't think that the schedule garners outside of the big four games. I don't see the schedule garnering a lot of cause for concern. We're not going against a lot of, a lot of big time players. You know, Kenny Pickett's gone from, from Pitt. Yep. 
yeah, I mean, Marshall doesn't scare me. I don't know if anybody else is scared by the Thundering Herd, but they don't scare me. Not particularly, um, no. Yeah. So I, I think that we're poised for another double digit season. Man, I, I feel similarly. And hey, if we don't get that mythical third loss or that third loss that I don't know where it's coming from, frankly, pretty stoked about that. Well, awesome. Matt, we're going to wrap this up, man. Is there anything else that you'd like to tack on? No, I'm excited for the season. You know, we're under three, three weeks, three weeks, four weeks away from, from the first game. I just, I said this on my introductory podcast. I, I really hope that as a fan base, we can stay patient. You know, we have a new head coach, but not only do we have a new head coach, it's a first time head coach. Yes. And ask any old time Notre Dame fan, first time head coaches have not done very well in their opening year, if at all in their career. At Notre Dame, it's a different gig. So I plead, I beg with the entire Notre Dame fan base, please be patient after week one. Yes. Just please be patient. It's not the end of the world. This team is talented. The future is too bright with the 23 and 24 recruiting class. The sun will rise on Sunday, September 4th, if we do not get our way the evening of the third, I promise you. Those are good words. And I'm trying to think as you're as you're men, as you're talking about first time head coaches. Unfortunately, my brain it's like oh yeah, Terry Brennan was a first time head coach, but that, that was back in the fifties. Uh, Jerry Faust was a, Faust was a, was a yeah. yes. Well, we he's, can just forget that. We can just forget that. It's a very very sweet gentle man, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, coming up from yes. Moeller High School to coach Notre Dame, uh, that's a different ball of wax, so to speak. But mm-hmm. no, you're exactly right, and frankly that there's going to be plenty of armchair quarterbacks at the day after the, the Ohio state Notre Dame game, regardless of the outcome. However, we do have just two absolutely banging recruiting classes. So it's not like this guy, he, he, if, if half the job is recruiting as a lot of people say, or more than half, he obviously has that in spades. So, all right, well, Hey, let's sign off. Then this has been onward to victory, a Notre Dame football podcast with the fourth annual season preview. We are geared up for the 2022 season. As always, I am your host, Alex Painter. I'm Matt Gary. And Hey, go Irish. (laughs) 